Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. My name is Simon. I'm an analyst on the ARC's genomic revolution theme, where I focus mostly on life science tools and diagnostics. I'm really excited to finally be able to share some of our research on multi-omics and the future of molecular biology. Uh, so let's get started. Um, you know, in previous years, uh, we have focused on genomics, the study of DNA. Uh, today, I'd like to take a step back to discuss the study of RNA, called transcriptomics, as well as proteins, uh, which is called proteomics, which I'm going to focus on pretty heavily. Um, we believe that the future of molecular biology is going to be powered by these multiple omics categories, how they interact with one another, how they influence each other to affect life, uh, disease, and health. So we think that the revenue opportunity for multi-omics is vast, encompassing everything from, again, life science tools and hardware to the associated software, um, applications in research, whether it's in government, academia, or translational research into the clinic. Uh, altogether, we think that these technologies and the applications thereof should scale at roughly 22% annually from about $110 billion this year to over $300 billion uh, over the next half decade. So let's start off at square one with DNA, the Human Genome Project. Contrary to popular belief, the draft sequence that was published in 2003 was not complete. The Telomere to Telomere Consortium, which was an international cohort of scientists and researchers, leveraged long read sequencing from both PacBio and Nanopore to finally complete the genome discovering hundreds of millions of base pairs of DNA and roughly 1,500 new, quote unquote, genes that we're just beginning to make sense of today. Now, the point of this isn't to disparage uh, short read sequencing, which was the technology that gave us the original draft sequence, uh, but rather to suggest that the same hammer can't be used on every single nail within biology. New technologies and methods, such as long read sequencing, are surfacing new biology at a breakneck pace. Uh, so here I've listed three areas of discovery that we are, are seeing empowered by long read sequencing. Namely, those are the detection of structural variants, which are a significant class of variation within humans and other organisms that uh, long read sequencing detects uh, much more aptly. Um, epigenetics or methylation, these are small chemical modifications to the exterior of DNA that doesn't alter sequence, but changes the way that your body interprets its own instructions. And finally, something called long range phasing. I'm sure many people know that uh, we inherit some DNA from mom and some DNA from dad. Chromosomes come in pairs. And so the ability to understand whether or not genetic variants are on the same side or on alternate sides, right? So on mom's or dad's side, these are areas of biology that we're just beginning to understand. Uh, and, you know, it just really goes to show you that even the genome still has new ground uh, that we're breaking. So as alluded to, let's expand our horizons beyond just the genome to, to talk about the transcriptome, which is RNA, and the proteome, which is proteins. Together, these three bodies of code are often referred to in something called the central dogma of biology, which crudely describes the directional flow of information from DNA to RNA to proteins, and finally to one's phenotype, such as uh, disease state or health or predisposition to certain conditions. And I've illustrated that here with a cartoon that actually shows a single human cell. You can see how the information moves the same way that you read from left to right and changes from DNA to RNA to proteins. And if there's one thing that you should take away from this slide, it's that these three categories of molecules are interlinked and the more that we discover how, the better our ability to prevent, diagnose, and treat various diseases. I wanna focus quickly on proteomics. Um, specifically, I'd like to focus on scalable clinical proteomics, meaning the application of the technology for the betterment of diagnosing and treating uh, diseases. And I wanna focus on this for a couple reasons. Firstly, the proteome is a really tough problem to solve, and, and throughout this presentation, you'll see reasons as to why. Uh, second, solving the proteomics problem carries an enormous biological and commercial potential. 
And we believe that there are several disruptive technologies that are boiling to the surface today that may allow us to really make a dent in one of the most difficult problems in biology. Uh, so first of all, clinical proteomics is really hard for, um, you know, for one reason being that it's, uh, it's limited to blood plasma in terms of, you know, one of the only real feasible, unbiased sample types in humans. So let me explain that a little bit more. Um, you know, sampling blood is a great um, way of looking at the proteome because it is uh, a global reporter of what's happening inside the body. What I mean by that is if you take a liver sample versus a lung sample versus a brain sample, the proteins are going to look very different. However, you know, virtually all organs and organ systems will leak proteins into the blood. That's why taking a blood sample is a good, you know, like I said, unbiased reporter. Um, and I'll explain some of the challenges with this because it's not quite so straightforward. Um, you know, if you look at the chart in the bottom left hand side, you can see the proteomics technology hasn't declined in cost the same way the DNA and RNA sequencing have. Uh, in fact, you can see the red line, which represents uh, proteomics, uh, really only falls in a staircase style a couple times over the past 20 years or so, each of these corresponding to a new piece of hardware uh, you know, technology that gives us a view uh, and a method for detecting proteins. Uh, but as you can see on the right, each of these colored dots represents a new technology that we think could enable a, a similar precipitous cost decline, uh, like a little bit like what happened to NGS and, or next-gen sequencing for DNA and RNA uh, back in 2008. So you can see here on the right, um, several new technologies such as uh, you know, those created by Olink, Somalogic, and Nautilus, we think are going to, to really accelerate the cost decline and, and increase the accessibility. Uh, of the proteome. So I want to give a special mention to the workhorse of proteomics today. This is technology called mass spectrometry. Uh, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. There are over 10,000 um, you know, units out in the field today across the world, uh, but the technology is quite hard to scale. However, we do think that you can teach an old, no uh, an old dog new tricks. Um, so similar to DNA and RNA sequencing, mass spectrometry isn't necessarily plug and play. It's a process. It involves, um, you know, methods that live both upstream and downstream. Uh, and we like to refer to those internally as bookends. And you can see them here, um, you know, represented on the left and right hand side. So over the past few years, uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of what we call bookend innovation. That is, um, you know, novel sample prep techniques or software packages that live upstream and downstream of mass spectrometry and that are really allowing it to be uh, revitalized, uh, which is terrific, like I said, because since these things are already in the field, we think that they uh, can be, you know, adopted in much more short order, um, you know, than otherwise would be the case. So on the left, you can see a chart of the concentration of proteins in human blood plasma. This is one of the biggest issues with using plasma uh, to study the human proteome. And what I mean by this is that the most abundant proteins in blood uh, and the rarest proteins in blood are separated by over 10 orders of magnitude in concentration, making for really difficult signal to noise problems, right? So, you know, being able to see those needles in a haystack. And I'll point out here, just because a protein is rare doesn't mean that it isn't important. Um, nanoparticle technology from companies like SEER are enabling both common and uncommon proteins to be detected by mass spec at the same time, just with a, a sample prep innovation happening on the front end. Um, meanwhile, other technologies like SWATH, and you can see that here in the middle, take advantage of certain types of metadata that comes off of mass spectrometry instruments, which enables them to be both faster and more accurate. Finally, open source computational packages like OpenPIP, which you can see a chart of on the right, um, you know, this is a technology powered by deep learning, really helps to accelerate the oftentimes tedious and manual analysis of mass spec data, which frankly, is still a little bit uh, artisanal and, and manual. And you can see how well the neural net performed to you know, PhD level human annotation uh, there on the right. 
And I'll move on to talk a little bit about some of the newer detectors, the newer technologies, the ones that are, are not mass spectrometry, but are really enabling a much deeper, wider view into the proteome than ever before. And this is a really amazing chart. It dates back to the, the early uh, 1930s and is representative of you know, state-of-the-art technology at each time point. So the y-axis, uh, which is in log scale, shows the percent of the proteome that is undetectable by the leading technique at that time. So the closer to the top, the better. Um, as you can see, the improvement really moves along at a snail's pace up until the mid-2000s, until several new methods, and I've called out those here, um, you know, Somalogic and Nautilus, potentially enabling us to see, you know, again, potentially north of 50%, uh, and we think by the end of 2024, um, scientists will be able to see the entirety of the human proteome the same way you know you can see the entirety of the human genome today. Um, we think this will be within reach of, of scientists within uh, the next few years. And, and we think these technologies are much more scalable than other approaches. Um, quickly moving on, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the complexity in the central dogma. So we're taking a step back again and, and considering DNA, RNA, and proteins. And if you, if you take a look at this chart for a moment, I think that there's, um, you know, I want to extend, I want to emphasize that there's a difference between detecting a molecule and fully understanding it in the context of what's happening inside of the body. So I'll, I'll call your attention to that solid purple band, the, the very thin one at the bottom that runs left to right. You can see that the 20,000 genes that make up our genomes do indeed move downstream to create what are called 20,000 canonical proteins. However, there's a much richer truth behind this. That is that there are things like regulatory processes, mutations, chemical modifications, all of these things happening in tandem to create you know, much more complexity as we move left to right. And you can see this chart's actually drawn to scale. Um, the lighter purple section that's moving up into the right like a ramp shows you that you know, if you look at the right hand side, even though there are only 20,000 proteins, there are over a million variations of those proteins, which we think only nanopore and semiconductor based sequencing technologies are really capable of deciphering. Um, and we think that the maturity of both semiconductor and nanopore technologies are at a point where we can start to make these discoveries and really meaningfully translate them uh, into clinical practice. Um, I'll be very quick here on this slide. It's the same that I've shown earlier about the central dogma. And I want to just kind of put this in here to illustrate the fact that sometimes a new perspective on an old problem is all that you really need. And what I mean by this is that the more that we master each of these domains of biology, DNA, RNA, and proteins, we can almost back solve or look at a problem from a new perspective. So in this yellow section, I've talked a little bit about some of the population scale projects that are going on where we're marrying together data sets that contain genomic and proteomic information uh, to help you know, really expose a lot of the, the underlying mechanisms that previously were very difficult to look at. Um, and then finally, with long read sequencing directly of RNA, not only can we sequence entire RNA molecules and directly compute the protein sequence, but we can also look back to understand how a really key regulatory process called alternative splicing gives rise to you know, biomolecular diversity and potentially how it's involved in the formation of various diseases. So to end, I want to talk a little bit about the market opportunity here. Um, you know, I, I think, again, this is a situation where we're really considering the combination of, of the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome, the associated life science tools, and the applications of these tools across many different end markets, whether it's for research, for translating something into clinical practice, or applying it in the clinic globally. Um, so altogether, once again, we think that these technologies will compound roughly at 22% annually from $110 billion to roughly $300 billion in revenue opportunity over the next five years. And the last maybe point to mention is we think the largest categories that, that comprise this forecast have to do with first and foremost oncology, detection, therapy selection, surveillance, monitoring, screening, everything in between. Uh, the non-invasive monitoring of organ health, whether it's cardiovascular, neurologic, um, you know, transplants, things like that, as well as some population health efforts that are really picking up steam today. And this is actually one of the main reasons why I wanted to focus on plasma as a sample type, because 
uh, liquid biopsies that is, um, you know, using sequencing or proteomics technologies to scour the blood for signals of disease, it's really important that all of these technologies be compatible with blood samples. And so that's, you know, again, one of the reasons why uh, that was, um, you know, an emphasis in the presentation. So thanks again for your attention and stay tuned as we publish a little bit more on this subject. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss with anyone further on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at sbarnettarc. Thanks again for your time.